from the text today, and I'm really excited to, to preach this text today because last week we got to look at this idea of, of hope and obedience. And we were looking at 1 Peter, and we were in chapter 1, verses 13 through 21, and we were seeing how our, our hope in Christ drives our obedience to God. So this hope that we have is rooted in the person and the work of Christ. And now today we get to see in these verses kind of an object lesson of what we talked about last week. So I hope that you were here last week, but if you weren't, you were able to, to come to the text this morning and see a Samaritan woman, a woman that Jesus engaged with. She didn't know about this living water, but she heard about the living water in these moments. And as she heard, she was driven back to her town to profess Jesus Christ to her neighbors. So I want to preach from the idea this morning of worship and mission. Jesus told the woman that she needs to worship in spirit and in truth. And as she does, as she begins to deal with what the Lord is teaching her, she runs back to town and goes on mission, lives on mission. And I want to ask you guys a, a question this morning, but before I have to do, I have to preface it with something. Have you guys ever been asked an offensive question, maybe an accidentally offensive question before? For me, it was just a few weeks ago, and I got home, and my wife Brenda, she said, uh, she's like, in her mind, she's like, I'm going to play a joke on Danny. And so she, she looks at me, and I walk up the stairs, and she looks at me, and she said, did you wear that today? And right then, you just get tense, and you're like, what, do I have a stain? Is it like something, you know, like, what's out of place? And for me, sometimes I'll accidentally say something offensive. Uh, I have a tendency to use the word actually. So somebody will say something, and I'm like, that, that is actually a great idea, as if they typically don't have good ideas. So I'll say these things that are accidentally offensive. And I, I don't want to be um, accidentally offensive today in this question, but in order for us to begin to even reflect on where we are this morning, I do want to ask you this. Why are you here today? Why are you here today? And that question may well up all sorts of things in your heart. Your mind, your soul may be reflecting on all sorts of things. And seriously, think about the moment that we find ourselves in. It is now October of 2020. It, it has been a, a crazy year for many of us. The, the, the things that have, have drawn our attention are so many different things. And maybe for you, it's, it's just the, the whole situation that we've been dealing with for the last few months, the, the COVID situation. There's, there's schools that are misplaced, students that are figuring out virtual learning, and maybe you've had the pressure there. Maybe you're homeschooling, and that's a change for you. Whatever it is, there's these things that take our attention. And the reason that I was asking this question is because I found myself Friday morning, I was driving through town. And as I was driving, I had YouTube uh, worship playing on, on my phone. And I, I, was just, I was just belting out a tune to the, the praise of the Lord. And it wasn't a good tune, but my heart was worshiping God. And um, I, I found myself about halfway through this song. And, you know, like right in those moments, a song maybe three minutes long, you're a minute and a half in, and you're really praising. Like that second chorus hits, and you're just going at it. And I found myself in that moment just, just going at it. And then all of the sudden... I hear, are you in the market for a new car? And I'm like, what in the, God, is that you? Do you want me to get a new car? And all of a sudden, and what had happened was there's a video ad in the middle of this worship song that even in this moment where I was worshiping God, my focus, my attention had been taken off of that moment. And all of a sudden there was this, this ad, this ad vying for my attention, this, this ad that wanted me to focus on what they were selling in that moment. And so I thought to myself, like, surely this must be some, like, off-brand, like, you know, just worship song. Like, somebody just posted this. They're trying to make some money off of it. And then it very, very much indeed, it was uh, the, the actual um, artist. It was at their actual official channel. And I'm like, man, you have video ads in the middle of your worship songs? But maybe you found yourself like that this week. Like I said, maybe you have that student in school, and it's, it's distracted you. It's taken your attention off of God. Maybe for you, it's even the, the start of football season over the last few weeks. Or this season typically has many new shows playing on ABC or CBS or whatever, whatever show you like. Maybe you find yourself in, 
and watching basketball and you find these things and they're vying for your attention. And maybe you even turn those things on in order to just get away from the world, just escape the reality in which you're living in. For others, it may be social media. And through this time of quarantine, you've sat behind the computer and gotten really comfortable at being mean to people. I've seen the posts. I, I, we all have the tendency to say something that we might say behind a screen that we wouldn't say to somebody as we think about loving our neighbor and being intentional. Maybe it's just the, the, the more and more presidential signs that you see in people's front yards. They're popping up left and right. Vote this way, vote that way. Maybe it was the debate this week that took your attention off, the train wreck of a debate. Maybe you were greeted with the reality that uh, your candidate wasn't exactly presented himself in the way that you wanted him to. And all of a sudden you're reflecting so much on this candidate in this debate. Maybe it's the upcoming holidays. As I said, we find ourselves in October, end of the month we have Halloween, then we have November and Thanksgiving and Christmas is coming up. And maybe for you, you have a large family and you, you're making holiday plans and all of those things are on your mind. And you're like, where are we going this year? What's going to happen? COVID and my family's canceling it. And all of these things are, are welling up in you. And even now, as I say that, maybe you're getting really tense and you're like, as soon as this service is over, I'm going to plan the holidays out. Well, hold on, don't go there yet, guys. Don't go there yet. Because we see in this text that this Samaritan woman, she is is greeted by the Savior of the Lord. He engages her, and he deals in her life with things that are taking her worship. And that leads me to point number one this morning is, you can worship in spirit and truth. See, the setup's perfect here. Jesus is talking to this woman, and he's talking to her at the well, and she's all of a sudden comes to this moment of, yes, give me that living water. I don't want to be thirsty anymore. But he doesn't just stop there. In verse 16, he says to her, go and call your husband to come here. In this moment, he, he takes it beyond. And sometimes we stop there, right? Like, we, we share the gospel with somebody. They're like, yes, give me that living water. And we're like... Okay, okay. They're hearing the gospel in this moment. This is, this is good news, guys. And so we start to think to ourselves, well, the person that I'm talking to, they're a pretty good person, and you know, Jesus is really nice. And I think Jesus might want to save them, and I don't really need to point out the sin in their life. I just, I just want to kind of like wiggle my way into, into this gospel presentation as if we can like make this happen, as if we can make this person accept the, the, the living Lord in this moment. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He confronts her sin and says, go call your husband and come here. Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right. You have no husband, you have, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. You have, what you have said is true. Jesus gets at the idols in this woman's heart in this moment. And it makes us reflect, Jesus is engaging her with the gospel. But even if you've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life, you may find yourself, again, dealing with those fleshly desires, those idols that you have, those idols that Jesus has saved you from, and maybe your worship has been misplaced. Maybe you have lost focus on your worship in these moments. But know, friends, that Jesus' message in these verses is that you can worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus says, as you deal with these idols in your life, what you come to find out is that your sin is great. Your sin is great. Your sin is sin against a holy God. We, um, in our family, we we listen to this thing called the New City Catechism, and it is some, some ideas that we reflect on the theology of God. And one of the questions that my kids will sing in the form of a song is, the question gets asked by this, this curriculum, is what is sin? What is sin? And the answer that they give is, sin is rejecting or ignoring God in his creation. I'm paraphrasing, but sin is rejecting or ignoring God in his creation. Or it's disobeying or not being in God's law. We're not living our life according to his law. Those things come in us, and what we find all of a sudden is, where's our identity? What are you finding your identity in? For this woman, it was very likely the relationships that she had. 
And Jesus is saying to her in this moment, you can't see me as great unless you see your sin as great. Your sin has to wreck you. You have to understand that you have sinned against a holy God and that you have to put those idols, put your identity to the side because I have a better way for you. I have ransomed you from the sins of your forefather. We saw that last week. I have ransomed you. I've laid down my life. I am the living water. If you trust me, you won't be thirsty. You won't be thirsty for those relationships. You won't be thirsty for those idols in your life. And more than just these big things that take our attention from proper worship, you know, we we talk about COVID and these distractions that we have, but what are your secret sins? What are the things that nobody knows about that you don't confess, that you keep secret, your, your spouse doesn't know about, your, your family doesn't know about, your coworkers don't know about, that thing that you run to in those moments, those trying moments in your, your week, those secret sins? Some of y'all are looking really scared right now. I better watch where my eyes go. Um, but yeah, I mean, oh no, he knows that I have secret sins. Well, hey guys, that's the reality is that we do. There's fleshly desires and things that take our eyes and our focus off of God. But here we can worship in spirit and in truth. John MacArthur, he he gives a little expression of this. He says, your worship is informed by your understanding of the revelation. Your worship goes up as high as it goes down. Because the deeper you go into the truth about God, the higher you go into worship. Listen to this next sentence. Superficial knowledge of God leads to superficial worship, and then people need to be manipulated. And we find ourselves in these moments, and we may have found ourselves going from church to church, church hopping, trying to have a a pastor or a, a, a worship set that we just really like that manipulates our emotions. We want to hear this good news. We want our emotions to be manipulated. We want to live our best life now in those moments. That's not what Jesus is getting at here. He's saying, if you know me, if you know this living water, if you know the truth that I have, you can worship fully in spirit and in truth. The the woman begins to question these things. And in verse 20, she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship? Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. See, it's not about a style of worship here. It's not about our fathers did it this way. It's not about our preferences and traditions. It's about a heart of worship. And again, this is why I I love this text because we even see how this is just married to the text last week. Last week we talked about those those preferences and those phobias and those things that derive our worship. Well, a proper and reverent fear of God, knowing God as the creator of the universe, knowing the hope that we can place and find in him, drives us to no longer want our preferences and our traditions just in and of themselves. In other words, we should never make those preferences or traditions the idols in our lives, but we all have a tendency to. And that's what she's saying here. Well, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say to do it this way. Jesus is, is not saying that we need to follow those ritual traditions in the hope that they in and of themselves will save us. Jesus is greater than that. We see this idea in Philippians. We need to count the interest of others greater than our own. We need to consider the interest of others. So even as we think of those preferences and things, they can drive us from the mission. They can drive us from the mission. It's, it's critical for us to worship in spirit and in truth so we can drive the right framework for mission. Worship is contained within an attitude or a posture towards God and is not confined to one particular set of traditions in our lives, but rather to every moment in which we exist. We're all worshiping at every moment. There's things vying for our attention at every moment. There is a hope that we can place in Christ or there's a hope that we can place in this world. The hope that we place in this world will ultimately dry up. The, the living water is one option that sustains us, but otherwise we have this idea of physical water that will run out and we will be thirsty. We'll get dehydrated and we won't be in the proper mindset. Jesus says to her in verse 22, you worship what you do not know. 
you worship what you do not know. She's been worshiping these things in her life, which have been soaking up her identity, have been soaking up all those things. See, the woman says in verse 12, our father, Jacob. And as we just saw, she said, our fathers worshiped. Our father Jacob at the well, he built this well. He is great. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And Jesus said, but the father sent me to die for the sins of the world. It's not about these these fathers that you're looking to, these great men in history that can save you. What they offer you is temporary. But I'm offering you eternal life through this living water. You can worship in spirit and truth. You have been adopted into the family of God. And that adoption does not stop at a previous father or a great man. That adoption goes all the way back to the father who adopted you, even while you were still sinners. He says, you worship what you do not know. Because she is looking back. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. See, we're not called to believe that our grandma had faith in God. It's great when grandma has faith in God, but I've heard so many testimonies. And friends, this is so dangerous. I've heard so many testimonies of I'm talking to somebody. And, and I even think to this, this one lady that I had a conversation with, and she was about 90 years old. And I asked her, I was just sitting there having a, a nice conversation with her at her house one day. And I said, I'm just curious how you got saved. Well, my grandma took me to church. And it was really special to me. And I'm not saying that she didn't understand the gospel, but she didn't communicate the gospel in that moment. She communicated to me what her grandmother believed, her grandmother's faith. We're not called to have faith in our grandmother or their faith, but we're called to have faith in the living water. Piper begins to kind of flesh this out, and he gets at the heart of this. He says, worship must be vital and real in the heart, and worship must rest on a true perception of God. There must be spirit, and there must be truth. Truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy in a church full or half full of artificial admirers. On the other hand, emotion without truth truth produces empty frenzy and cultivates shallow people who refuse the discipline of rigorous thought. But true worship, comes from people who are deeply emotional and have and who have a lo- love deep and who they love deep and sound doctrine. Strong affections for God rooted in the truth are the bone and marrow of biblical worship. Now the reason we spent so long looking at this this woman's story is because we actually see in these next set of verses that it leads her to mission. And we're actually going to see in just a second how that mission was even overlooked by the very disciples that Jesus was with. Let's turn our attention to the next part of the text this morning. My second and final point this morning, you can accomplish the mission through proper perspective, a proper perspective. What we see here is the disciples, they begin to be so worried about food that they tell Jesus, Jesus, have something to eat. And Jesus says, the the, the fields are plentiful. They are ripe for harvest. Don't miss this. And yet we see this woman leaves her jar of water, the very jar that she had brought to the well, that she had filled up to have a drink. She leaves her jar there. She runs back to town and proclaims the good news of the gospel to her friends, saying, this is a man who told me all that I have ever done. So in verse 27, the disciples, it says, they marveled that he, Jesus, was talking to a woman, but no one said, what do you seek her? Why are you talking with her? See, in this moment, they dismiss this Samaritan woman. And that makes us ask the question, in what ways do we, some, we, um, what ways do we just overlook people? In what ways do we do that? Because they did this. See, the Samaritan town is the same one that we see the, the James and John, the son of Zebedee, saying, They reject God at one point in scripture and they ask God, should we send down fire from heaven on that town? Should we pray to the father to destroy that town? See, there was a a big thing happening here against the, the Samaritans and the Jews in the communities. And what we begin to realize is how we think about people becomes the way that we feel about people becomes the way that we act towards people. So when we act as if people aren't interested in the mission of Jesus, 
when we act as if Jesus can't save them, and when we act like people are too broken in these moments, we overlook an opportunity like the disciples did in this moment. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? Spurgeon says it this way, some of you good people who do nothing except go to public meetings, the Bible readings, and prophetic conferences and other forms of spiritual indulgence would be a good deal better Christians if you would look after the poor and the needy around you. If you would just tuck up your sleeves for work and go and tell the gospel to dying men, you would find your spiritual health mightily restored. For very much of the sickness of Christians comes through their having nothing to do. All feeding and no working gives men spiritual indigestion. Be idle, careless, with nothing to live for, nothing to care for, no sinner to pray for, no backslider to lead back to the cross, no trembler to encourage, no little child to tell of a savior, no gray-headed man to enlighten in the things of God, no object, in fact, to live for. And who wonders if you begin to groan and murmur and to look within until you are ready to die of despair? You're ready to die because you've placed your faith in a temporary water. You're exhausted and now you're thirsty for spiritual things. But in that moment, we're dying of despair. See, this woman leaves her jar of water. She's worshiping in spirit and truth as she runs back to this town to proclaim the glorious news of the gospel. And as we continue to see this text, we see that she goes to the town She tells the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. The people of the town. This woman runs back to the town. This woman who was so ashamed to go to the well that she went there in the middle of the day, which was not typical. See, going to the well in the middle of the day would have um, been been just uh, not the norm. And the reason for that is typically in, in the time and culture here, You would go get water in the morning to prepare for that day. It was cooler in the morning, and you would typically go with others from the town. So you would go together as a group, and she finds herself going at noon. And maybe that's because of some of that sin in her life where Jesus says, go and and bring me your husband. She goes back to town, and she begins to proclaim to the very town that she was hiding from, being in the well in the middle of the day. She begins to proclaim, come, come. See a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and they were coming to him. They were like, let's go. Let's see what this woman's talking about. This woman who was so ashamed that she found herself at the well in the middle of the day. Let's go and see what she's talking about. She says that um, the disciples here miss this moment. Because as these people are going out of the town and coming to Jesus... Verse 31, the next verse says, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat. They miss it in verse 31. Rabbi, eat. And you have to wonder if Jesus in these next verses, he tells them that his food is to do the will of the Father who sent him. And then he says, look, behold, the fields are white with harvest. They are ripe and ready for harvest. And you have to wonder if they're trying to get Jesus to eat in this moment and he sees the people in the town coming to him. And disciples are so distracted by the thought of food in this moment. They are so distracted by what they feel like they, you know, they're like, it is noon. We're eating lunch right now, Jesus. We can eat lunch at at 11 or one. It has to be at noon. They're so distracted by their time. And that's a way that we fail to apply mission to our life. We get distracted because we think our time We dwell on our time. We think all about ourselves. And all of a sudden we find that the way that we think about our time becomes the way that we feel about our time, becomes the way that we act with our time. When we drive our way of thinking through this, we become very selfish in the way that we give our time. They were coming out of town for him. Jesus is ready in this moment to to engage these people as they come out of the town. And have you ever been more concerned with something than an opportunity to present the gospel? Has your time ever been so important to you that you just kept on tracking right away? Even though God had a moment for you where he put this person in, in, in front of you? I have. I've failed. I've been selfish in those moments. But 
in those moments when we know that God wants us and has a message for a broken and hurting people, we can be faithful. We can worship him in spirit and truth. And I just want to give you an example of this. I was at a, a VBS last summer. We were in this big apartment complex. And as we're, we're there, these, these, um, these kids are, are coming and they're hearing about the gospel. They're hearing about the good news of Jesus. They're doing their crafts and activities, a normal VBS. Well, there's teenagers, and they start coming over, and they're getting a little rowdy. And so I have the opportunity to talk to this one teen- teenager. He's eating a hot dog there, and I'm like, hey, like, what do you think about VBS? What do you think about this? And he's like, oh, no, I'm just eating my hot dog. And I'm like, well, do you know why we're here? And he's like, no. I'm like, would you like me to tell you why we're here? He's like, yeah. I'm like, we're here to proclaim the good news of the gospel. And I shared the good news with him. And I'm like, what do you think about that? No. I'm like, man, that's kind of discouraging. I thought God had me in this moment. And in the meantime, there's more teenagers walking over. And then a little bit of chaos begins to ensue. So I find this kid, he's on his bike eating his hot dog. He, he rides away. He doesn't care at all about anything that I'm saying. And this other kid walks over and he's like, I'm interested in hearing what you're talking about. And more and more teenagers are coming over, but this one kid picks me out and says, I want to hear about the gospel. So I'm sharing the gospel to this kid. His name's Michael. I'm sharing the gospel to Michael in this moment. And more and more teenagers are coming over. And the next thing I know is I'm in the middle of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to this teenager. And the, the setup that we had, the VBS there had a porta potty And I see the porta potty out of the corner of my eyes just flipping upside down. Like, I mean, the kids are just wrecking stuff. There's trash flying everywhere. It's pretty much a riot in the middle of this apartment complex. And in the midst of all of that, I could have just said, guys, we need to shut this down. We need to go. Or I could have kept pursuing the gospel in this moment because I felt like God had told me to do that. And that's what I did. And as Michael hears the gospel, he responds to the gospel. And it was such a special moment because I honestly, it was one of those moments where I felt like God wanted me to communicate something to him, but I didn't know where to go next. And he's like, yes, like, this is amazing. Like, I'm a sinner and I want this savior. I want him to be king of my life. And he's saying things that like, I, like mature church members don't even grasp sometimes. And it's just this crazy moment. And what I find is I'm just like, okay, Michael, just, just pray. And like, I don't even know if he knows what prayer is. Like, he doesn't have any type of religious background or anything. And in this moment, he just starts praying, confessing sin, just saying, God, I need you. I need the living water in my life. I'm exhausted, even as a teenager, from the sins. And I can't bear the weight of my sin anymore. And I want the good news of the gospel in my life. Jesus says to the disciples, do not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. See, these people are walking over from the town. Jesus says, look up. Don't say there's four months. Yeah, we're supposed to be going to another town and we're stopped in Samaria. He says, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest right here now in this moment. In this moment, as we leave this church today, the fields are white and ripe for harvest. And we have to realize that sometimes. The question that we begin to ask ourselves, are we centering our life around the gospel or are you centering the gospel around your life? That's an important distinction to make. Is the gospel the center of our life? Does the gospel inform what we do? Does the good news of the living water, is that the direction that we try to, to go, knowing that God is spirit and truth, we can worship him in spirit and truth, or do we center the gospel around our lives. God, my way is more important. God, I have this desire. I want to do this. The uh, wonderful news is that as this woman begins to worship in spirit and in truth, and as she gets it right, verse 39 through 42 tells us this, this great reality. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. Guys, don't neglect the power of a short testimony. Eight words right there. Her testimony is that Jesus told her all that he ever did. Verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what he has said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed 
the Savior of the world. This morning, we get to respond to that Savior of the world. We get to respond to this. In these verses, they say, we no longer believe because of the testimony of the woman, but we believe because we've placed our faith in Jesus. They know her terrible past, and still she proclaims Christ to them. This unlikely Samaritan woman became a worshiper of the one true God and worshiped God by immediately going on mission and taking her story to the town, which results in as many people as possible transformed by the gospel. Let's pray this morning. Father God, I thank you for this picture of this Samaritan woman, Father, who although she did not know you, Father, you confronted her, you engaged her, Father. You confronted her sin in her life, and Father, you were doing a work in her, a work that only you can do. And Father, we see here that she begins to worship in spirit and in truth. She goes back to the town. She wants to proclaim you as the Messiah, the chosen one, the one that had been proclaimed throughout the Old Testament. She knows that you have the power to transform lives, and she tells her town about it. Father, help us to live out that mission. As we seek to properly worship you, as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth, as we seek to lay aside the distractions of our week, as we seek to, to not think of it as, as the way that we see people, but the way that you see people, the way that you created them, as we seek to not think of it as our time, but a time that you have given us and that we need to steward well, Father, help us engage people on mission. Father, we know that truly the fields are, are white for harvest, Father. One sows and another reaps, Father. And we thank you for that great and glorious news this morning. Help us to live in the reality that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.